get turned on here. Good morning. Welcome. Hopefully everybody's bus got here on time. Um, it's not as freezing. That's good. So I'm Rob Tiffany. Uh, wow, it was like the last session in this room yesterday, the first one today. Um, did anybody come to last night's session yesterday? Excellent. So I told you it would just be like a kind of a apples to apples comparison. Kind of at the end of the day yesterday, I talked about doing NoSQL to take data offline and doing CRUD operations that way. Today, we're going to mix it up and use SQLite when you have more demanding needs of heavier uses of data uh, and better query operations than you would doing object collections. Um, uh, and so that's kind of the, the gist of it is, um, you know, we, we all need to build mobile line of business apps. I say that really authoritatively, didn't I? Maybe we don't all need to do that, but I feel like we do. Um, anyway, uh, and, and I think, you know, one of the big differences between consumer and business enterprise is, you know, data is often a huge difference. You know, lots of data-driven stuff, huge amounts of data coming from different systems and stuff like that. Uh, and so the requirements are a lot higher. And so uh, this whole session is going to focus on using SQLite. Um, Right now, uh, we're, I'm also using some new bits. I don't know if you're familiar with our Azure mobile services folks. We've had some technology out. And uh, at our build conference, gosh, it just seemed like it just a few weeks ago in San Francisco, we announced some alpha bits. It sounds weird when I say alpha bits, because isn't that a serial we had when we were kids? <laughs> so we had some alpha bits <laughs> the other morning and uh, uh, some new sync technology. Uh, you know, kind of a lightweight sync, and uh, I have a he heavy background in different sync technologies over the years, and so it kind of piqued my interest. And so uh, while the bulk of the session is going to be on working with SQLite to power your line of business apps, <clears throat> I decided let's take a dependency on these new alphabets uh, to show you sync, because I know for a lot of people that's critical, because uh, either you're writing the plumbing, you know, web services to move data, kind of like I showed yesterday, or you're going to let someone else do it for you. And I know lots of people love to just have things taken care of for them. Uh, and I know IT managers and directors and CIOs especially love that. Uh, developers would love to write everything themselves because we like to write code, but you know, that's not always what the business needs. Uh, is this pretty much a, is this a developer crowd? Are you a developer? Raise your hand. Yeah? Okay, great, great. Yeah, we had to, we talked about that yesterday. No doubt this, this event skews heavily towards IT pros. Uh, and so just make sure that you know, we have a, the proper expectations. Because I know a, one friend of mine in here doing a, Andy was doing a session on all kinds of crazy networking stuff you could do from Windows Phone uh, and, and tablets and stuff. And some IT pro folks thought that they were going to learn how to build VPN tunnels and maybe do working with networking equipment or something like that. And it's like, no, you're not going to do that. So here is the, I almost said obligatory, why should you care? I guess it's not obligatory, but I think it's important, especially because a good friend of ours said, you know, you really ought to pound in at the beginning here. Why in the world would you care about this stuff? So, you know, I, I might be passionate about this, but I definitely need to convey why you would care about using SQLite and Sync when you're building these mobile solutions. Uh, and so we'll just kind of go through some deals. So I, I've already kind of mentioned the enterprise, you know, apps have, you know, b bigger requirements typically than consumer ones do. And so that, that runs the gamut. You know, most of it is just heavier use of data as part of it uh, from back-end systems. Security requirements are usually much higher. Lots of, you know, there's millions of consumer mobile apps out there, and most of them don't use any security at all. But when you're in the enterprise, you need to be authenticating with backend systems like Active Directory or Azure Active Directory, and uh, uh, and then doing authorization to see different things. You know, not everybody gets to see everything, and so those are uh, those are part and parcel. And the, the great thing when you start taking a dependency on Azure Mobile Services, the great thing about that technology is you get to cherry pick what you want to use. You don't you don't have to use all of it, but they uh, has anyone ever heard the term like uh, mobile backend as a service? That's kind of a new thing. It's kind of a successor to MEEP and some other acronyms. And, and the, a lot of the idea there is, let's take a lot of this great functionality, because you know, you know, if you follow Azure, 
it seems like every few weeks we're adding new features and functionality. And I remember when I knew, I felt confident that I was an Azure expert back when we first came out with it, and it was like web roles and worker roles and stuff like that. It's now so broad that there's no way you can be an expert at Azure. You start having to be an expert in just pieces of Azure because it does so much. Um, and so because of that, one of the things we've done with Azure Mobile Services is we try to make a lot of hard things simple. So things like authentication, you know, we kind of wrap around that, just like we're going to do with this sync. Um, another feature I'm not going to talk about today, we make push notifications real easy. You know, when, when you're doing it yourself, you can imagine the over time when you had to write special code for Apple's no push notification and Google's and Microsoft. Azure Mobile Services just wraps that up for you, and we use things called notification hubs. And so basically think of it that way, is using this technology is just going to accelerate your time to market by making lots of hard things really simple for you. That's the big takeaway. So the other reason why you should care about this, employees using these line of business apps on the go have to keep working, no matter whether the connection is there or not. This is not a new concept, even though I read stuff all the time where people think it's magic about taking data offline on mobile devices. But it's so important. Um, you know, the network, I have connectivity here, and then I walk to the other side of the room, and I don't. And so you got to keep working offline no matter what. And so that's got to be a critical element when you build your systems. So let's talk about the SQLite part of this. Whether you knew it or not, it's the world's most popular database. Um, I know you thought it was SQL Server or Oracle or maybe MySQL or things like that, which are it's open source and hugely popular. But SQLite is just everywhere because it's this you know it's this little embedded database that can run anywhere, and it people run it all. People even run it on servers. I don't know if that's the best use of it, but but uh, it, you know it's certainly great, and it's embedded in lots of products that you probably don't even know. It's kind of is an engine to do a lot of things in the background. And so it's just this file-based, you know, kind of, is anyone familiar with like our SQL CE database? Okay, so it's kind of like that, you know, except it's open source. Uh, and Microsoft has decided a couple years ago to kind of join in with that effort. And so we contribute to that foundation and we've been starting to build a bunch of wrappers and things to make it easy to use. Uh, it runs on, I guess every platform there is, you know, instead of giving you a list, it would probably be easier to give you a list of what it did not run on, actually. It runs everywhere, um, which is a good thing. And so you can imagine Azure Mobile Services folks saying, hey, you know, we're really democratic about everything here from the Azure. We want to we empower Android and iOS as well as Windows and Windows Phone. And so it, it made sense to take a dependency on SQLite as that database engine because it, it comes built in with those other platforms. And so that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's very fast, it's reliable, it's, and again, it, public domain, it's really interesting. You know, people talk about the different open source licenses. Will my company let us work with this license or that license or could, can I change things? This thing, there is no, it's just public domain. You can do whatever you want with it. It's just a free for all. You can grab it, change it, do whatever. Um, the great thing is, is this uh, ACID support, you know, if you're a, a DBA, you know, the ACID support is critical. You need to make sure that you have that durability. And this is really critical on a mobile device where your device, the battery could die on you or it could just crash or something, you know, or you could drop it and a truck could drive over it, whatever. Uh, the, the takeaway is that durability, you know, when you're building mission critical systems that run on mobile devices and you need to guarantee that an insert happened and was committed for data and things like that. Just, you know, it's always easy just to think about transactions and like ATM machines and how critical it is for those things to happen or roll back. That's all that ACID support, you know. So the fact that this little mobile database has that is a great thing. You know, you can be confident that your, your data is secure and, 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 you know, not in an indeterminate state. And so the last kind of part here, why you should care about this, is this great stuff from Azure Mobile Services. So we got these new bits for offline data sync, so you don't have to be connected all the time. And unlike my session yesterday, you don't have to write all the logic and stuff to think about how you do offline. They took care of a lot of it for you, and I'll show you that towards the end of the session. It's really great stuff. Um, they also put a wrapper around it to enable things like change tracking. 
And you might wonder, why do I care about change tracking? And so you can imagine if I'm downloading lots of database tables from a, some back-end database and I'm replicating them down to the, the device, um, instead of me knowing what, what's changed during the day, like if uh, the typical example, let's say I'm, I work at a, a package delivery, and so overnight data sinks down to my device that's gonna tell me where to go, what to bring, things like that for my route the next day. And so that would be pumped in there. And then throughout the day, I might you know, have people sign proof of delivery for a package, I might be inputting data, changing data, things like that. The great thing with this change tracking is you don't have to care about all the new data that you inserted or a customer inserted or you updated or changed. This change tracking engine on the client is gonna worry about all that for you and then when it's time to push whatever change back to the server, uh, you don't have to, you didn't have to write code to know what's different. It's, you're just gonna push it back, it's gonna figure it out for you and send the changes back and get it to your backend database. So lots of easiness. The other thing here at the end, conflict resolution, and I'll show you an example of that too. This is a scenario where we, we use some versioning. If you know, some, you can imagine, so if you're a database person, you know uh, maybe things like, uh, terms like uh, optimistic concurrency or things like that, the way you do locking, the way we do transactions and databases. So when you're doing something with sync, sync introduces a lot of problems with databases because normally everybody's connected and it's easy to know what's going on and who's committing and who's locking the table and all that kind of stuff. But when you're doing sync, you're basically, I'm grabbing a bunch of data and I'm going off to La La Land for a long period of time and you get that all kinds of changes could happen on the database server while you're disconnected. And so you also know that other people, you and someone else could insert the same row, or you or someone else could update a, a column in the same row, and you would cause a conflict, or, 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 or could you know, start at the server. And so most systems on the planet, most websites, they just don't even care about stuff like that. They follow the rule of last in wins. Well, in this kind of offline optimistic concurrency scenario, you may actually care about, you know, maybe last in wins isn't the rule that you want. Uh, you, you might want to be able to dictate this, you know, because if someone updated a row and it's in the server and then you updated it and try to overwrite that, um, it could screw up, your, you know, if you built a point of sale system or whatever, it might screw up what's going on or screw up inventory or things like that. So I'm going to show you how we can do conflict resolution where we detect that, hey, this actually happened, and then you're given the option either programmatically, or in, and I'll show it to you interactively on a screen, where you can choose who's the winner and who's the loser. You know, does the server win or does the client win, that kind of thing, so I'll show you that. So that's a nice little extra feature to really help you out there. And of course I said, you know, obviously all the security we get with Azure Mobile Services, and you can authenticate with the Azure Active Directory and do the push notifications everywhere without having to know how to connect into all those other systems from all the different mobile uh, phone vendors. So let's get after it here. What I'm gonna do in this first section of getting started, it's kind of like, uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of the nuts and bolts of piecing all this stuff together. Um, I thought it would be good just to have this on these slides so that when you can take them with you later on, it'd be a kind of a good reference to show you how do I build all this stuff? How do I get the bits that I need downloaded and stuff like that? So it's, it's not as much of a, I'm teaching you some great wisdom here, it's more of just the nuts and bolts because people like, like a nice little step-by-step -step way of getting started. So let's start at the beginning. There's a website, sqlite.org, that you go to. Um, and so when you go to SQLite's website, you'll see there's a, you know, it's a great place. It's great if, if you want to become, you know, if you want to learn about SQLite, all the documentation on how to use it and what it's capable of is there. And then it has binaries for all the different platforms to download. Of course, there's also source code too if you want to do your own stuff on other platforms. <laughs> Excuse me. And so the, the key takeaway here is you'll go there and you're going to go to find the uh, runtime, you know, for RT 8.1. Yes. Oh, can you speak to the microphone too if you ask a question? You can also usually get the the extensions from the Visual Studio Gallery. So is one right. different or better than the other? No. Okay. No, absolutely. You can do either way. Either way. Absolutely. Good question. Um, so for the, for the 
for this particular session right now, all the bits that I'm working on, I'm taking dependency on, especially with the new stuff with Azure Mobile Services, it's currently, right at this moment, only working on big Windows 8.1, the RT stuff. We will be getting the phone bits out there so you could do the universal thing. But just to be clear, since it's still an alpha stage, so as we go forward over the next few months in the summer, you're gonna see new releases. I would say keep, a, keep an eye on uh, uh, Azure Mobile Services team blog. In fact, I was, I was looking at their Twitter feed. I think it's just at Azure Mobile. Uh, I think they just released some bits to work with Xamarin for iOS, actually to get going there. Are you familiar with the Xamarin kind of tools, the mono tools where you can do use your C-sharp skills? Okay, so anyway, so it's kind of a work in progress. So today, that's kind of where I'm at, but expect this all to change, and it's just gonna get a lot easier, absolutely. And so anyway, so you're right, whether you go to the gallery, whether you go right to their SQLite side, and, you, and you're gonna download this extension, you know, this uh, Visix uh, extension, and, and you're actually gonna have to change that you're gonna change the uh, extension on that uh, from zip to Visix so you can Im import it. And this is, again, this would be coming externally into Visual Studio doing it this way. So when you get that on your, when you have it downloaded and you need to install it, all you do is the Visix file on your desktop or wherever you have it, just double click and that'll start the install to put it in Visual Studio. And then you'll bring up and then inside your application, your solution, you'll add a reference and you'll, you'll see it, you'll see that extension there kind of at the bottom for SQLite, and that's where you'll check the checkbox. And again, the, another thing to think of is, um, and, and versioning is an interesting issue, you know, SQLite's being updated all the time, all the time. And so, you know, you may see new versions every few weeks. You know, you may or may not need something in those new versions, uh, but there's always updated stuff. And so you'll add that into your app that way. Um, the, a big caveat here is when you're doing .NET development, a lot of times you just don't even think about what CPU you're targeting and it's just defaulted to any CPU. That's not working with SQLite. SQLite's very dependent on you selecting a specific architecture for your processor. So you actually, for your project or when you're doing multiple projects, like if you're doing a universal app or whatever, you need to specify I'm targeting x86 or ARM processors for you know, smartphones or things like that or x64. And so you have to be really specific for each project that you're doing that with, because the any CPU just doesn't work. Uh, and, and you know, the reason for that, part of it is we're taking the dependency on a native C++ binary application in SQLite, and it wasn't designed originally for our vision of anything working everywhere uh, using that any CPU kind of high-level .NET language type thing. And so uh, that's why we have to give it, give it some help there. So the next thing I wanna do is since, even though this is mostly a SQLite section, session, since we're gonna do the sync stuff, you're taking a dependency, so I'm gonna walk you through a bunch of Azure Mobile Services stuff now, because it's, it's important to have this. So you gotta grab the SDK. So from inside Visual Studio, you know, you'll, you, you know you can right click and start managing NuGet stuff. So you'll do that, and then the online section, you're gonna search for this Azure Mobile Services uh, SDK make sure there's a flag, a, a combo box at the top, and make sure to select include pre-release, because right now everything is, is alpha and then it'll be beta and things like that, and so uh, it won't show up otherwise. So you need to do that. Uh, currently, and this will be out of date, I'm sure, in a week or so, but that's 1.30 alpha two is what I'm working on right now. Uh, I'm sure it can only get better from here. Um, so that gives you the SDK to do a lot of the work there. And then there's this thing called SQLite Store, and you will also add that um, and kind of search for, for pre-release uh, as well, and that's kind of this 1.0 alpha. And uh, what it does, it takes a dependency. We have this other kind of a, it's almost, I guess it's like a separate company called Microsoft Open Tech uh, that's doing all the open source stuff for us and working with the open source communities. And so there's been lots of wrappers uh, going around, and, and Andy here in the back of the audience spent a lot of time working on some. Well, we decided to finally try to get our act together and unify all that, and so in our MS OpenTAC, we created a portable class library to try to be maybe the one source of the truth for how we're doing it, because there are a lot of different, you know, basically the different wrappers you've seen out there, most of them, you can categorize them in one of two camps. There's the ones that look like they're doing link to SQL, 
And then there's the ones that look like they're doing standard SQL, DDL, DML stuff, you know, uh, like you would do on a normal database server. And so, uh, so anyway, the SQLite store is a wrapper around SQLite, and, it's, and it, it, that's what empowers it, it with the things like change tracking and some other stuff that Azure Mobile Services is going to use. And then under the covers, it takes a dependency on that PCL. So let's walk through a little bit of the more Azure Mobile Services stuff. And again, like I said, I'm putting these all in the slides. I can also walk this through you if my wireless worked uh, to show you on Azure itself. But this will be a great reference for you to have so you can walk step by step. So you would go to, you need to, go to the Azure portal. You know, If you've got an account through your company or if you have an MSDN account or you can do a, a trial account, things like that. Uh, and one of the choices when you go down is Azure Mobile Services. And so you're going to click and say, yeah, I want to create a new mobile service. And then it asks you some questions here. You kind of see on the bottom there, you know, you need to create a unique URL that, for pointing to your service. You need to choose a new or an existing database. Azure Mobile Service will give you a free, like I think it's 20 meg database just as a starter for you to start playing with, but you can upgrade that to whatever. Um, select a region wherever you are in the country or the world, uh, nearest data center, so you have better performance. And so you go, do that. And then also you're going to choose .NET for the back end. That's another critical element here uh, to making this stuff work, uh, you know, with the sync stuff. Uh, in the past, you know, up until recently, Azure Mobile Services, the whole back end is built on Node.js. Uh, so it's using JavaScript on the back end for everything. And needless to say, we got a lot of feedback from our Microsoft.NET developers that, you know, hey, we sure would love .NET to be back there. And so, uh, so that's what we did. It also kind of changes the behavior. If you've worked with Azure Mobile Services, you always see the same example, this to-do list thing. And it's this not so strongly typed amorphous weird thing where it's just kind of putting blobs of data in la la land and creating stuff for you. And it just never quite looks like something that an enterprise would ever use. Um, and so today you're going to see <laughs> something that's completely different than that, that's .NET and strongly typed and it looks like databases that you might actually deploy in production. And so that's what we're going to choose there. So it's going to work with Azure SQL Database. Um, and I'm happy to tell you Azure SQL Database is getting a lot better. You know, we've had some announcements in the last few weeks about new tiers of database, uh, you know, more guaranteed I.O., things like that, some higher scale systems. And so, uh, so this is a good thing. And so uh, with the Azure Database, you're going to, you know, you'll have that unique name that was based on the URL you created for your Azure mobile service. It'll create the DB, you know, and has your database server, the new or existing. You'll create a login name. You'll create a complex password for it. You'll select a region for where you want that database. You'll probably select the same region that your front end web service is on uh, so it all goes faster. And then if all goes well, you'll get the little success thing at the bottom. And then, then you'll be ready to rock and roll and get after it. And so with all that built and ready to go, you'll go to this next screen where you're going to choose a mobile platform. And so this is where we kind of give you some starter code, some starter bits, projects. Uh, to help you for, you know, whether you're doing Windows Store or iOS or Android or, or you know, Xamarin, things like that. Uh, and like I said, initially, today, right now, with these new bits, you know, it's going to be Windows Store. But again, that'll change rapidly. So what you do is you can see here, you can just download this project. And what I, what I want you to do is, instead of creating a new store app, at least in this example, I'm going to have a, an app already and you're going to add an existing stuff because, you know, um, I have an aversion to Greenfield stuff because I know it's not very real world. Every demo you ever get is a Greenfield project that you create from scratch and, and there's lots of rainbows and unicorns. Um, I prefer to show existing things that you got and you need to connect to something. Um, and so, uh, and so that's what you, so you'll download this zip file that's got this project. And the reason I say keep it safe is it actually has some, a key in there and some other stuff that allows you to talk to the backend systems and the database. And so you don't want anybody to see that because that's going to be in the code. Uh, so you'll extract that code. There's a particular folder though in there. You'll add it to your Visual Studio project, the client project that you're already working on perhaps. Uh, and then you'll right click on the solution and you'll navigate to that and you'll add that project file into your existing solution. And that's how you'll be up and running there. Look at that, up and running. And then testing locally. Um, so you'll have a client 
and a server part projects in the same solution. Uh, so you need to build that and right click and do a new instance and then if all works, you get the browser will come up and then it'll look like that and tell you that you've got a light bulb on which must mean it's working. Uh, I'll show you that in a, a second. This is kind of, the, the, this is the real magic. There's a lot of stuff I'm gonna show you but this is really the connection. So your client application uh, from Windows is, is right here where you're just gonna instantiate this mobile service client. And so what you'll see here is you see I'm doing a new one at the top and you notice it's localhost. So if, you, you know, you, if you've installed the Azure, normal Azure SDK with Visual Studio, because you, know, you want to test locally, and I, that's how I'm going to do this whole thing locally, because I, when, I, when I come to do uh, conferences, I never count on being able to reach the internet. <laughs> you never know. Um, and so I'll do the whole thing locally. I use my local SQL server and everything. It also allows me to show you really quickly changes. When we do some of the changing in sync, I'll be able to quickly show you how things are happening both on the client and server. I'll be able to be uh, more able to do that more quickly than I could if I was actually talking to the cloud. Um, but then you see all this commented code below here. And it basically what it's saying is, hey, once you're good to go testing locally, you're going to comment out this first top line, the public static, and you'll uncomment this other one where it's ca calling out to the Azure mobile client, but it's now pointing to your, your site up in the cloud. And of course, everybody uses Contoso, right? And with your key. Um, so you know what, I'll, before I jump into the DDL side, let me, I'll just uh, wake up my laptop here, and I'll just show you quickly kind of the solution here. Before I jump into any of the code or stuff like that, if you, um, if I look on the right-hand side here in the Solution Explorer, you'll see that I have an existing Windows 8.1 app that I just included the bits with. And then when, when I unzip that file it, it, I got the, and added in, I got this Contoso Hardware Service project that was added in here. Uh, and sure enough, kind of like I mentioned, you right-click on there, and I'm going to say debug, start new instance. And this will connect to localhost and, and run in here. And, and this, it's interesting, I'll show you some utilities. We won't do too much because the database is empty. But this kind of gives you that warm fuzzy that, hey, things are actually working. Uh, the cool thing is, is with, the, with this new sync service and everything, you know, Azure Mobile Service is, just, is taking a dependency on our new web API, which is great because I'm a fan. That's all I talked about yesterday was using the web API, REST and JSON. And so that's what all this is built on. And so they did all the hard work to transport data using REST and JSON and some extra fun stuff like doing deltas and things like that for when you're doing change tracking. And so a lot of RESTful URIs you see here, just like, uh, like my session yesterday when you're, you're doing your own REST services. Uh, and so you, know, you can see I've got get, you know, get everything from customer here. And that's the cool thing. You can actually try this out interactively in your browser. Kind of like yesterday when I was showing you how in IE you can build and test and do everything with your REST services without even building a client. And so you can try things out. You can pass in values. I'm going to just do this. Nothing's going to come back because the server database is empty. But you kind of, you can figure out how you can interactively test this way. And kind of when you look through here, so you see get, this is kind of like get all customers. This one is get by ID, you know, so you're going to filter it and get just one particular customer. Patch is where we're going to send deltas, uh, you know, exchange deltas up for change tracking rather than always overriding everything. So this is where we're going to be more efficient in how we do data. Post is actually adding a new customer. And then delete is what you would expect. So anyway, that's an interactive way to play around with that. Um, if I look to the other side of my Visual Studio project over here, and this is what I'm going to use today to kind of interactively show you, I'm connected to the Azure, the kind of the temporary Azure database running locally in kind of in a hidden way in SQL Server. And so here I can, you know, I'm going to be working kind of this, doing the same tables I did in yesterday's sessions, customers, orders, and products. And so you can interactively, you can, uh, see the schema that, that's created. In fact, it might be interesting just kind of open the table definition and you'll see how it's gone from really kind of everything being Varchar Max uh, blobby looking to uh, still using some of that. But you'll notice uh, some of these new columns that have been added. You know, so you're always using an ID column because you've got to have that primary key for change tracking and stuff like that to keep things organized. 
and then the things I put in as, you know, I'm using the ID and the first name and last name simply here, you see we have this version, this row version column. If anybody remembers a change we made in SQL Server 2008, when we uh, added in change tracking that way to work with the initial version of the sync framework, we did some row versioning there. So the row versioning is gonna help with the change tracking. It's also being used to help with conflict resolution because it'll, it'll know there are different versions or the same versions of something that's getting updated by multiple people and that's what's gonna help this system tell you, hey, wait a second, you might need to decide who wins in this. And then you see a couple of date times created at updated and then deleted. So the deleted is kind of like tombstone. So in other sync technologies we've used in the past, sometimes we've used separate tables. You know, like each, each primary table that you created would maybe have a matching other table or more. Actually, like merge replication has lots of tracking tables. It would have a tombstone table and a whole lot of others for deletes. This one, they just decided to consolidate everything all together on the existing table. So it makes your table a little wider than it would have been otherwise. And then for the purposes of this session here, I'll just kind of, we'll, we'll do a lot of the syncing and change tracking looking uh, at the customer table. And so I'll be able to quickly t look on the server side, uh, SQL, SQL Azure side, as, as we make changes on SQLite and go back and forth. So that's the, the quick gist of that. So uh, DDL, data definition language, also known as creating your database and tables. Um, but I'm a database guy from a long time ago, so I have to speak the language, right? So the key takeaway is how do I create, I need to define my database and my tables. So that's what this is all about. So creating the database, you know, that I mentioned that SQLite store wrapper, that thing is used to take care of creating the, the, the database itself, which is kind of the shell around all the tables and the tables for you. Uh, and then you're gonna create the schemas and views actually too. So unlike, uh, Unlike other wrappers we have for SQLite and other ways to work with it and all the other databases you've used, instead of using your standard kind of DDL, create table, blah, 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 and, and defining all the data types, you actually are gonna create a class. Uh, and the class and the data types of the class are gonna define the schema for you. Uh, and I'll show you what those look like because they're a little different. They're decorated differently with some attributes and stuff like that. But so your class will create the schema for each table and you won't be using standard DDL operations like you may have grown up with. Um, and so you're gonna also create them on both sides and there's some wizards to help you do that. But you'll have a, you'll have a class I'll show you here in a second on the client side that'll define the SQLite tables and then there'll be an equivalent class of the same type that's gonna kind of work with, is anybody familiar with the Entity Framework? Anyway, we use the Entity Framework on the back end under the covers to dynamically create data tables for you on the fly. Uh, based on these schemas that you create. And so those will work a little differently. And I'll show you the, the nuances here. Um, so here's the first one. So on the client side table, you know, this is kind of the boilerplate of what it looked like. So I'm creating a customer table, but it's just a class. Uh, and I've got to use mobile services and, and Newtonsoft's JSON. So that's the JSON.net, which is far and away the fastest JSON, you know, serializer there is. Uh, and actually I saw some news on Twitter last night that all the new vnext for ASP.NET, we've just decided to abandon everything and use nothing but JSON.NET for everything because it's just so much faster than all the other serializers. And speed is your friend, so let's go with it. Um, so uh, our friend uh, Newton King, he's really thrilled about that, that his code got in there, yay him. <laughs> so no, it's good stuff, it's good stuff. Go with what's, go with the best. So anyway, so real simple. So again, it, it's always gonna use an ID. You may typically in the past, you might've tried to call it something else, but it wants you to use ID. And then these properties, you know, so I've got first name and last name, but kind of going with the newtonsoft.json, you also need to put these attributes above each one and kind of set that JSON property and set the property name. So that's a requirement for that when you do that on the client. And then the last thing you have to add which is a, is a new thing, is this version. You've gotta add the versioning in because it's gonna need that to do that tracking and stuff like that. So that's kind of what a, a simple table would look like on the client side. And then you have to do the equivalent on the server side. And so in that server project, you know, I had the two projects, 
you know, you, you'll, you'll probably have, I'm, I have a, and it uses this folder called uh, data objects. And so I use data objects on the client and the server and you'd pop that in there. And so this is the simplified version. It's because this is really just all you care about is first name and last name, but you'll inherit from entity data. And so that's gonna loop in with the entity framework and it's gonna help drive and dynamically create or do whatever it needs to on the fly with the backend server. And then also part of the create database process on the client side is kind of when you're loading up, and I'll show you the code. You know, so you have your kind of your app.xaml CS, this first thing that's coming up when your project loads. This is where you would kind of create, you see this var store, new SQLite store, and you name the store. That's where that your database will get created. Uh, and then all the, all the tables you're gonna have would be listed under that. So you see I just have one here, create customer table, where I see define table. And so that kind of goes, you saw how I had that data objects, customer objects. So it's kind of kind of doing that thing, you know, it looks like you're creating your generic list there, basically. Uh, and then the sync context, which is something new. And so that's an asynchronous thing, and you have to initialize the sync context over the whole store that basically says, this database is now enabled for data sync. Because uh, if you don't do this, none of the sync stuff works. Uh, and so you'll name the store as a parameter, and then the sync handler thing, uh, with referencing the client, the reason for that, and I'll show you that, that has to do with the conflict resolution technology that's built into there. And then for every table, you see below here, really small, this kind of this public static thing, the iMobile service sync table. You'll create one of those in that up at the top, and I'll show you here in a second uh, for each of those, for each table you're gonna have. So let's, let, me, let me just walk through that real quick. So good old app.xaml, the beginning of everything, right? So here you see a bunch of using statements from mobile services, SQLite store, and sync. And sure enough, right here at the top, you see I've got the, the code that connects me either locally or to the server. Then you see here, I've created some statics for each of my tables, my custom, I created a customer table, product table, and order table of type of those respective objects, and I'll show you that. Um, and so the, the key takeaway here, in, in each one, you calls this get sync table, basically. And so that enables sync for each given table. And so from then on, every operation that you want to do against each table, uh, you do it against these variables here, this customer table, product table, everything will operate against that. Whenever you want to do any inserts, updates, or deletes against the respective tables in SQLite, you're going to call against those. Um, and then if I scroll down to the bottom here, you know, you know, at some point, we've got a, as we're loading, I'll call a method called create database. And then this is where we, this is where we get things built. And so it's just like that code I showed you there before, where you can see, you know, creating the new store. And then I've got, in this case, I've listed three tables that I've created where I do the define table and then do the sync context and, uh, and we're off to the races. So that creates it, but let's take a look at what it is specifically. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, that looks just like the code I showed you on the, the screen there. Here's order when I'm creating new orders. So again, same kind of ID, and you're just using the JSON property names for everything and making sure to add version, product, it was really simple. And then here's something different. It's not gonna be part of the sync deal. I call it order view. So, you know, when you think about databases, you think about tables and you views and stuff like that, and so since we're in link land here, I just created that, maybe I'll create a theme park called link land. Anyway, we've created a view. The view is gonna come, be important when it comes to doing multi-table joins, uh, because kind of the link to SQL paradigm is not as adept as real SQL in joining lots of tables on the back, you know, like you would expect. Uh, and yet, it's an absolute requirement to be able to join lots of tables to get good, you know, good stuff. And so, uh, in this case, with Link, I'm going to create projections. I'm going to create views to give you exactly what you need to be user friendly. And I'll kind of replicate a lot of the stuff I did in my session yesterday, where I'll take an ugly, unfriendly looking order and make it look usable to the reader, to the viewer of the application. And so, that's how we'll do the view. Uh, and of course, you won't need that view on the server side. 
And so now if I go to the server project, the Contoso hardware service, and I look down, I'll have those, those same kind of objects, except they're just all simplified. And again, they just, the only difference is they just inherit from entity data, but it's only just the minimal stuff is in there. You don't need everything else. And so that's the gist of it. And I'll close all these guys. And we'll get back after it here. So anyway, hopefully that's pretty simple, clear. It's pretty darn easy to create a data. I mean, it was mindless. It was just like one line of code to create the database and then just extra line of code for each table. So no hard stuff at all uh, to build those things out. So DML, data manipulation language. Now that we have a database and a schema, we need to put some data in it and do some stuff. Or what's the point, right? So let's work with data. So let's kind of go through a high level, and some of this will just seem like a repeat for a lot of you who build these line of business apps already. But you know, I want to kind of think about the scenarios of how data is used in lots of line of business apps, and so things I've been involved in, lots of projects and everything. So there's the obvious thing to start out with, is you're downloading data, you're loading data, you're viewing data. Uh, and so the different views, the screens, the pages, the forms of your app, you know, are presenting data coming from the local database. Uh, and of course, the key element, why we're using sync is because we don't want to keep reaching out to the internet on the fly to paint screens with data because you're going to have lots of problems there. The app is always going to be looking locally for everything it needs. So the obvious things, loading that, and of course the other part, customers, people, employees out in the field typing in new information, putting in that data, updating it. Um, and then workflows, wizards, all kinds of things, you know, where you'll go through your application where you've got to follow a workflow to do a task. And so data will change and you'll add things and you'll come out to the other side. The creation of something like creating an order might create, you know, I'll do a very simplified way of creating an order here, but you know, we, many of us have all been on complicated projects where you kind of had to go through a multi-screen workflow to create some thing. Uh, and so you're transforming data along the way and you might be able to go next, next, and then back and change it and things like that. Sometimes you gotta do calculations on local data. Uh, and then of course there's also the idea of capturing telemetry because not only are you gonna capture the actual line of business data and send it back to the server to run your business, this is also a great opportunity to capture environmental data or other things about the app and the device uh, that can be used for analysis. The most simple things that you think of when you start is all my error handling. When I'm capturing errors and I log errors locally, I would like to take those errors and send them back to my server in, as well for analysis by my QA department back at HQ, right? Uh, you may also want to capture telemetry on how are users using your app. I've been involved on in people building these little compact framework apps with 400 screens. I know it sounds insane. How did we fit all that in memory? Well, very cleverly. Um, but you also find out when you build big apps for your employees, you sometimes find that the employees don't use everything you built, or some things aren't as important as others. You thought it was, and you built this giant thing, and it turns out when you get telemetry on that data where you track this user logged in, and there's 400 screens, but this user only seems to use 10 of them. And then this other type of role only uses these. It's great to track that and see usage patterns. Uh, and then you capture other data. What was the battery life like? What was the, how, what was the memory level? Things like that, because you need to troubleshoot in the field. If, if you start, if people say, hey, my app is crashing, or I'm running out of memory, all that telemetry is gonna help make your apps more resilient over time, because you'll be able to say, I see the user was on screen 23, and at that point, the memory level was almost at the breaking point, and they executed this method, and then it crashed, and I captured the error log, and, and capture all that stuff and send it back and do analytics. Um, remember, lots of little data, right, to analyze big data. So that's kind of what I'm thinking there. And of course, here's how you're gonna do it, and it's really simple. You're just gonna, lever you're just gonna use link skills. Uh, if, you don't, if you don't use link today, and it's not like I'm some giant fan of link, because I'm, probably more of a fan of just regular old SQL because I've done it so long. But we make, we've got great websites on MSDN that will show you how to learn Link if you haven't already. And in fact, I know there's some deal like called 101 Link examples and everything. And so if you have a relational database mind and normal SQL queries, 
and you need a place to say, how do I translate this SQL query to what the link equivalent is? We've got tons of examples to show you do that. And I'll show you a lot of the simple ones today to get you started. Uh, and, and obviously, you don't have to use normal SQL to do this. So I'll go through four super simple examples. This is what a select would look like. So I'm going to have a, an app, a view, that's using a, a list view control for to show display a list of customers. And so in this case, and, and I'm not going to do any MVVM stuff or anything like that today. I'm just going to just mindlessly show you one screen connecting to this data. And so I'm just going to set the item source equal to the result of this simple link query. So all the queries against SQLite through this wrapper are asynchronous, which may seem curious because SQLite is a synchronous database. But don't worry about that. <laughs> don't mind the person behind the curtain there. Um, anyway, I'm sure it's doing something magical. Anyway, but the, here's a simple SQL query where you're just getting everything, you know, and it always looks backward. Usually you say select star from blah, 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 where equals, you know. In this case, you're doing from, and you're basically, remember how I said you're always going to go and get those static variables that I created at the beginning? So it's in that app class, so you always say app dot, and then you'll see in your IntelliSense all those tables will show up since you made those statics. And so you'll do customer table, then you'll say select. You had to create that from something, so C is kind of like down there. And so in this case, this just gives you everything. You didn't put in a where clause, and then you always say to, link, to list async. And then that's going to fill the list with customers. So that's a simple select. Oh, look, it's Annie Wigley. We're going to do an insert. So um, same thing. Go against the customer table, and then I have this insert async, and you have parameters. Uh, and here I just do everything all at once. You could do these inserts where you break it up into pieces, but I just do right there in that method, I do, I create a new customer object. You saw the customer object we created. And then I fill it with data, the first name and last name, and then and I shoot it right in, all in one shot. An update. It's Nick Randolph. Um, in this case, we need to first, you kind of do a select to determine what you're going to update, and then you update it. And uh, watch out for that light back there. Anyway, so in this case, in this scenario, I'm actually using a where clause. I'm basically saying, hey, give me everything from the customer table where last name is equal to Randolph. And you'll see that when I go through the code. Uh, but you cannot use a, 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 this, the return in a query object to instantly update it, like you might do in normal link when you're doing a collection of objects. So you have to use this kind of format this for each here where you, the, the key thing is you have to kind of do this await with this query to enumerable async to get back this stuff. Trust me, I spent hours wondering why my normal link stuff didn't work. And luckily I finally gave up and asked someone in the product group and they said, oh, you got to do it this way. Okay. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have waited so long. Anyway, I'm a typical developer. So that's how you grab the data. And so in this case, I'm doing a for each. And so basically, I'm just kind of iterating through that and then basically you know, finding everything. It's, in this case, if it's Randolph, I, and then I just change the first name to Nicholas. And I'll change his first name from Nick to Nicholas. And then you just do the update async, and you're good to go. And then delete works exactly the same way as update. Do your where clause or do whatever you want. And then just like I did in my session yesterday, I'll do lots of different deletes and updates, not just simple ones for you. So that's the gist of all that fun stuff. So let's let's go take a look at how that works. All right. Let's run our trusty dusty simulator here. So Clever use of breakpoints and debugging to teach code, right? So I'm going to do a lot of F10s and F11s, just like yesterday. So here's right there in that app.xaml. You can see, first thing I'm testing here when I create databases, make sure that I haven't already initialized this for sync, because I certainly wouldn't want to do that twice. And then literally, this one line of code, boom, creates store.db. And sure enough, I'm looking in the obscure hidden place that you would find on your local machine where this file is being created, and there it is. It just got, it just appeared. Um, and you can, when you're doing debugging and messing with your code, it makes it easy if you need to delete it and start again, stuff like that, when you're figuring stuff out. And then I just step through here, and I'm creating, defining my three tables, and then I'm setting that sync context with this special handler for conflict resolution. 
and I'm good to go. And here's my slightly askew Windows 8 app. And so right now I've got nothing in there, so we need to fill this data, fill it with data. So let's do an insert, and let's walk through that. And so just like the simple code I showed you there on the, you know, I'm gonna go through and literally just add these new data objects right in the same method and set it separately. So I'm just gonna create Andy, myself, Nick, and my friend Martin for a customer table. And then I've got here, I'm gonna fill, do the product table. And so I'm gonna put a motherboard, some RAM, some hard drive, graphics card. Maybe we're going to a computer store to buy some stuff. And so I filled that with data. And I'm not using observable collections or anything, so nothing magically is binding to the table. So I'm gonna have to click select to show you how to fill that. But that's good, because we need to see how to do that anyway. And so the select, again, these are simple ones, just like I showed on the slides where I'm just saying, give me everything. I'm not doing any special wear clauses. And so I'm gonna have both customer product and something called the bad order list bind to that to fill those with data. And then sure enough, here we go. We got Andy, me, Nick, and Martin and customers. We got our motherboard, RAMs, hard drives, stuff like that. It's all good. So that's how we do inserts and how we do selects. So let's start going through deletes to show how that would work. So I'm gonna do a simple delete one. And so in this case, if you look at the code, I'm basically gonna delete myself, someone whose last name is Tiffany. Notice here that there, in the IntelliSense, off of this select query here, you have this dot take one. This is interesting stuff, because the Azure Mobile Services folks, even with the SQLite wrapper, they wanna make the code look identical to the code you would use with normal Azure mobile services where you're dynamically working over the internet live with a server database. And because if you've ever worked with it, there's ideas of paging and bringing down different chunks of data and stuff like that. And so they wanted to make sure they're using the exact same methods locally as they would remotely. So take one basically means just give me the first one in case there's more than one. In this case, there won't be more than one, but I just thought I would illustrate that. They wanted to make sure there's consistency whether you're doing local or remote databases. Because up until now, 100% of Azure Mobile Services has always been working with remote database live over the internet. So we'll step through that. And the key takeaway is we're gonna delete myself, and so I'm gonna disappear from the stage, and the rest of the session's gonna be over. But I need to select, because I'm not doing any fun binding to refresh that. And so sure enough, all we now, we just now have Andy, Nick, and Martin left. The old crowd. All right, so let's delete many. We're gonna kill some more people here. So in this case, oh no, no, we're not gonna kill Andy. We're gonna get, look, we're, we're gonna get rid of everybody who's not Andy Wiggly in this case. So this is kind of an example of deleting more than one. Huh? Yeah, you're cool with that. So you're st he's still alive back there. But if he disappears, you'll know this worked, actually. Wouldn't that be a... Nah, never mind. It sounds like a weird dystopian movie or something like that, where you change the code and you get deleted in the code, and then you're deleted in the real world. They've had lots of movies like that, right? Maybe not. All right. But it, the deal, like, if you die in the game, you die in the real world? There was some movie like that, right? <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna iterate through. I'm doing that clever use of query dot to enumerable async. And so I'm gonna delete, and you see, look at that, I'm deleting all those people. We only had to delete two, because I was already gone, and so we'll hit a select, and sure enough, Andy is the only person left in, at summer camp. <laughs> all right, but he's not long for this world. I'm gonna delete all. And delete all is stupid simple. I'm just gonna do a select for everything. And with no where clause and Bob's your uncle. All right, so everybody's gone. So there's varying degrees of deleting. So let's let's start again because we need to show you how to do some of these updates. So let me reinsert all this stuff. Let me take off this breakpoint so we don't keep getting annoyed with inserts and stuff like that. And we'll select. All right, so now we're back to square one again. Got all our friends, got our motherboards, stuff like that. So let's do some updates. So let's just update one. In this case, I'm gonna update Andy Wiggly. Anybody whose last name is Wiggly, there's only one in there. And I'm gonna turn Andy's name to Andrew 
shocking. And so we iterate through that and select, and sure enough, there he is. He's Andrew Wigley, not to be confused with Andrew Ridgely. If you're not from the 80s, you won't get that. All right, now the next one, we're gonna update Mini. We're gonna update everyone who is not Nick Randolph, basically. And so if you're not Nick Randolph, your first name's gonna change to Nicholas. And so we'll iterate through that. And sure enough, boom. So Nick is still Nick Randolph, but everybody else, I'm now Nicholas Tiffany, and we've got Martin's Nicholas, and so is Andy. So we're all Nick's now, Nicholas's. So then let's go ahead and update all everybody. And again, we'll use a simple select all. And now everyone's last name is going to be the common name of Hegendorfer, which no one will get unless you worked on the Windows Mobile team for years with us, or you're familiar with the Bluetooth SIG. <laughs> And now everyone's last name is Hegendorfer. So lots of wide range, good capabilities there, inserts, selects, and updates. So uh, let, me, let me reset this one more time. Let me delete all. And we'll reinsert and start fresh again. And uh, let's talk about creating an order. So I'm gonna create an order, let's say, Andy wants to buy some RAM, and so let's create the order for Andy buying some RAM. And so what you see I do here, of course, is I need to, not of course, how arrogant of me. Um, you know, I'm casting, I'm grabbing that customer list and what the selected value that you saw me just check, and, and I'm casting it to, to the appropriate data type, and over here, and so, you know, through the clever use of tooltips, you can see that there's Andy Wigley, and, that's the order ID, because uh, we're using GUIDs for everything. That's kind of part of the change tracking deal on the ID instead of using integers. And then sure enough, yes, he bought some RAM. And then I'm gonna add to the order table, because our order table was previously empty, so we're gonna, let's create this new order, which is the successor to Joy Division. All right, so now we've created an order and let's, uh, let's, let's select that. So here's why I said bad orders. And I did this yesterday too, when I was doing my other session just using object collections. This is an example of a bad order. The, the person, the, the, your employee who's using the system you built, this order taking machine, or it could be point of sale, or you could be taking credit cards, they have no idea what that means. Because Luckily, we're all computer geeks, so we know exactly what that means. The first line of that order is the order ID, which is a GUID. The second line is the customer ID for Andy Wigley, which is a GUID. The third one is the product ID for RAM, which is also GUID. And the last one is one. You bought one stick of RAM. That's not very obvious. So we need to make something friendlier for the employee, or also if you're building a point of machine, sale machine that's pointing back at the customer so they can see what they actually bought. So this is where we have to make a clever use of joins. And I spent a lot of time in struggling with this because the kind of that link to SQL paradigm, or it's not even a good fair to call it link to SQL, just doesn't work as well with joins. So you gotta do a lot of for eaches and things like that. But the important thing is to show you that you can do it and how it works. So let's, let's walk through a three-way three -way table join here. So let's step through the code to do that. Because I wanna make it friendlier for the UI. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just say, hey, show me everything that's in that order table. So we know we just created one order. And so now I'm gonna start doing the for each and I'm gonna enumerate through that order table. And then the first thing I do inside that now is, I, is, is where I start joining to other tables, right? And so I'm gonna just basically say, you know, from the customer table ID is equal to order that customer ID. You know, it's kind of the things you want to do in a SQL join, right? Or you're joining on IDs, right? And then I'm gonna iterate through that to get another part of the answer, right? And so now I have a little bit more of the information from the customer side and everything, and now I'm gonna query against the product table and I'm gonna basically say, hey, product ID and order ID, or order dot product ID, to match, to join those tables together and now I'm drilling into the last level of iterating through to find the answer to this. 
And so this is, remember how I showed you at the very beginning of the session, I, that order of view uh, class that I built? Because we're creating a view. So this is like database stuff. Tables, views, no triggers. Well, maybe. Um, so here I'm creating a, a view where I'm basically constructing and, and, and instantiating that object I showed you earlier and populating it with information that we gathered as we loop through here. And so, uh, you know, the order ID, a, a friendly first name, last name. And then so I create a generic list of, of type order view and create a new order list and new that up. And then I'm going to add this new order that we just created into that list. And then I'm just going to set the list view item source equal to a simple link query, you know, of showing me everything in that list I just created. Uh, in this case, it's just two lists. It's not an async call because we're not calling SQLite. We're not doing any async stuff. And so the, the takeaway there is now you have something that looks a little friendlier. Now, I will admit the good, good for your order ID still looks strange and you might want to use something else. Uh, but you know, you might have a SKU or something like that. Uh, but now it basically is telling you the obvious thing. Andy Wiggly bought one stick of RAM rather than GUID, 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 one. So there's your example of how you will do joins and it'll just be through four each's within loops and everything, you know. So it's not just a straight shot like you would do with SQL joins, but it is possible and I just knew it was important to, to be able to show you a way to, to do that. All right. Let's move on. Actually, let me close that first and delete that. All right, let's talk about, well, we're in the home stretch. Let's talk about sync now. So syncing data. All right, has anyone ever worked with merge replication before? Excellent, everyone in the room, good. All right. Merge Replication had a little brother named Remote Data Access, or RDA, that was kind of simplified, and it did simple things like pull and push. You know, pull for each table, give me all your stuff, or you could put a SQL query in there to filter it, and then push, pushed all the track changes back to the SQL server. Uh, well, guess what? Luckily for all you people who've been using all that technology in the past, this is following the exact same model. So we got pushing and pulling and stuff like that. So push async, because we're all asynchronous these days, basically takes all those tracked changes of all the inserts, updates, and deletes you've done locally and pushes them back to the Azure SQL database. Uh, and, and, it, and it just does the deltas, you, you know, and so it just takes the changes and sends it back up there. Pull works just like you might imagine, like I said with RDA. You're going to do a pull statement for every table that you want to download onto your local device. Um, but the cool thing is with a pull is that you get a parameter to filter what you're pulling because you don't always want to, you know, in my example, I'm pulling everything, but you won't want to do that in real life. You may have a hundred table database and for, you might have reference tables that you'll pull everything and, and you might not change that very often. <clears throat> but if you have uh, 20,000 employees in the field, you're going to filter it because each employee needs to get their specific data. If I'm a salesperson in the West region, I just need to get my stuff from my customers and everything. I don't need to see Fred's stuff uh, and, and Fred's customers. So you'll use either link or OData as a parameter to filter what data is coming down to, to the device, which is great. Then there's this notion of a sync queue. And so it's tracking changes locally but there's actually a queue. I don't have any code to show it to you, but it's, it's real simple. You can, you can t take a look at what's going on in the pending queue, and you can see this queue of changes that are filling up. Uh, and so that'll kind of give you an idea. And what's interesting, and I, you know, and when I've written books about using RDA, you know, to have consistency, especially on the server database, um, there's this notion of uh, pulling and pushing. Basically, if, if I call a pull method, to help make sure nothing goes wrong before the pull method to pull new data is called, actually the, the internal logic of this looks and says, hey, is there anything pending here locally that I need to push first? Because you don't want to pull something and overwrite changes that you made from the server and blow up all the stuff you just did. So if it detects that there's stuff in your sync queue of track changes, it's going to automatically push those first. 
and then it'll pull to keep your data consistent. And then purge, that's like another horror movie. Um, purge async is basically just the same as deleting all your data. You, call, you can call purge async against particular tables. So you know, if you've been doing the, the delete tombstone kind of thing, it'll leave some of those, it'll delete, like maybe those maybe deleted or marked for deleted stuff, you know. Anyway, you, you may or may not have need for this, but it's a good way to just blow away a bunch of data locally that's no longer needed anymore. And then the conflict resolution. I mentioned at the beginning of the session, we're disconnected, so it's optimistic concurrency. So all kinds of changes could be happening everywhere, and so we have to have conflict resolution or we're no better than just any website that's doing last 10 wins. Um, and so we have these sync handlers that are gonna detect conflicts, and I'm gonna try really hard to create a conflict here uh, to show you that in, in action and, and making that work. The other part is, and I kind of touched on this a little bit, I showed you some of the classes I built on the server side and how we use the web API. Well, there's a little more to it. So lots of people ask the question who've done mobile services, uh, they're really confused. Every, all they see is examples on this to-do item thing that they keep using over and over again, Azure Mobile Services. And a lot of people going, how do I create another table? <laughs> and things like that, I don't know what to do. Good question. So I showed you part of the answer. You create, first you create a class on the server side that then inherits from entity data, but then there's some other things. And again, this works with just the typical MVC format of web API. So you here, you right click on the controller folder on the server side, and I'll show it to you in a sec. Uh, and we've, had a, we've got some new items here at the bottom, and you can see Azure Mobile Services table controller is a choice that you can make. And so you choose that, and then a dialogue pops up. And the first combo box in the dialogue, it says, hey, select a model class. Well, the model class, you'll see a list of those classes that you created, so products, customers that you created, that you inherit, and they will only show up if you inherited from entity data. Otherwise, they'll be invisible. So you choose the one that you're trying to wire up. Then there's, the, there's a, a data context class that's already created for you in the solution, so you just select that. That's a no-brainer. And then it's gonna, just like if you've ever worked with Web API, it kind of automatically names whatever you're calling, like if I'm, it, it just puts, it appends, it puts it in front of the word controller. You know, if it's a customer controller, product controller, order controller, things like that. And so you use, this completes that equation of how do I do all this weird stuff or adding, because I need to add 100 more tables, so please tell me what to do. So this is, this is the missing link there. And so that's how you do it. And so I know it's kind of small on the screen, and I can show you in code, but this is an example of kind of what the controller looks like uh, when it's created for this. And so very similar to things you see in the normal web API. You see the get all customer, very, that's exactly what you see with the web API. Uh, but then you see the idea of a single result, which is also familiar where you're passing an ID, just give me the customer where customer ID is blah. Here's one you don't typically see is patch. And you see the word, the clever word delta in there. Patch is what it's using. It's, a, it's a, one of the RESTful URIs for when we're sending up data deltas from change tracking. And that it, so it's using the patch verb, uh, which isn't used very often. I don't see anybody use it very often in, in when they're building RESTful stuff. And you know, I know there's a lot of REST of RNs in this room, and so it's like, what is patch? Okay. So anyway, that's what it is. Post for something new. Delete, obviously, is for deleting customer. Here's what a simple pull method looks like. So first thing you see is that you see me create this var filter. You need to create some kind of filter. In this case, I have no filter. I'm basically doing, this is equivalent of select star from customer table. But you could do as complex a link query as you'd like to with where clause and everything to just get just the data that this particular person needs. Uh, and so uh, you know, that could be based on an employee ID or all kinds of different variables to filter and get them the right stuff. And then you just, against that particular table, so you do a pull for every single table that you wanna pull down, and you do pull async, and that first parameter is the filter. Um, and then we're still building out, like I said, these are alphabets. This is a work in a motion. Like the second parameter actually didn't exist in the alpha one bits, and now it exists in the alpha two bits, and we're still figuring that stuff out. Um, anyway, work in progress because <clears throat> you're gonna be able to use that for stuff in the future. Um, push is even simpler. So push, you don't have to do table by table. Push basically says, 
hey, take a look at everything that changed and push the changes. And that's really what it is. So it's very simple. You just do push async off of the sync context object there. Um, purge is basically you, you, you do a filter for purging. Again, this is just like doing a delete query uh, locally to get stuff out of a table. So here's the moment of truth. Let's, let's make some of the sync stuff work. We're alpha two. I'm feeling the love. All right. So what I'm going to do is I will use this to reflect our server database. Um, so let's let's fire up the simulator again, and let me fill. And let, let, I've got it. I, we're starting from scratch, so let me fill it with some data real quick. And. Um, First thing I'm going to do, actually, is I'll do a pull, even though there's no data on the server side, and it should do something magical, because if the logic's working, like I said, it, it, should, it, might, it might accidentally push first. So I'm doing a pull with everything, even though I, it's, it's empty up there. And we go through there, and let's quickly take a look. All right, now look at that. So now we've got some data up there. You, you see the customer table. And, and so for the ID, you've got all these GUIDs, binary data for version, you know, these created at and everything. And there's our tombstone table for deleted. So uh, let's, uh, let's start exercising the sync technology. So let's just kind of go do a free for all and start making changes to show you that this works. So I'm going to change my, my name to Fred. Let's go back to the simulator, and I'm on a pull. I'm just pulling everything in this case. And now we're looking locally. Oh, let me select, because I'm not doing observable collections. And look at that. My name is Fred. This actually works. Isn't that cool? Um, so let's do, let's, uh, let's, do one of, let's do one of our updates. Let's do the update one, where, where we're going to change Andy to Andrew, locally. And select. OK, so now we got Andy is Andrew. Let's push. You've already seen the code, so I won't belabor it. Now let's go back to the server side, and let's refresh here. And sure enough, we got Andrew now. So this is good. This is all just happening automatically for you. Um, let me, let's, let's do an update all, actually. And change everybody to Steve Hagendorfer. And select. All right, let's push those changes. OK, let's go back to the server and refresh. Now everybody's Hagendorfer. So now let me try to create some conflicts so that we can exercise the conflict resolution so you can see interactively how you will, will choose one. So I'm going to change, let's see, how do I want to do this? Maybe I'll change this last name to Jones. And now, let me think, how do I change the Jones? I'm going to update all. Push. All right. All right, that should be back to Hector for again. Let's see here, I'm just making sure I'm following my script right here to make sure, because it's, it's sometimes it's, it's been harder to force a conflict. Um, so it's basically a change been made. I'm going to make a change here, but I'm going to push again rather than pull before I get a chance to. So I'm going to push, which in this case is, should it try to overwrite.
All right. Just bear with me. I apologize. So I need to see a conflict. I need to show you this screen. All right. So update all to push. I'll follow this one more time. There we go. Created a conflict. All right. Uh, of course, I didn't walk you through the code, but I can show it to you. So it, it detected like multiple, you know, an update happened on the server, and I tried to override it with an update I made on the client. And it's thinking, hey, you know, it's using that version column, saying, you know what, you know, lots of people are making changes to the same thing, and you know what, we, we might be violating business rules or something like that, and I don't want to overwrite you. So basically, this is kind of an interactive view here, where it's like. You know, how do you want to resolve this conflict? Do you want to use the local version that I'm uploading, or should the server version win? So this is the kind of the friendly thing. If you've ever, you know, you've used any of our products, you may have seen something that looks like this when you've had multiple, uh, a newer instance of a Word document, and it says, hey, there's a newer version of this. Which one do you want to use? Or you may have even seen this Exchange server or email. You know, and things like that. You know, which one do you want to use, the newer version or the older version? And so that's what the gist of this is. And so this would be interactive. So if I say use local version, it will allow me to overwrite that row from what I'm uploading. If I say use server version, it will not do it, and the server is going to win. Now you will either do this, or you'll actually programmatically put code in there in that handler that has the rules that your company wants to follow for who wins or why. Um, and so that's the, that's the gist of it. And so in this case, I'll say use local version, and it'll overwrite. Uh, and let me show you the, uh, I'll stop it here, and I'll show you the code click, and we're already a minute over. But we're having so much fun. Um, let's see. There's my conflict resolution code here. Sync handler. Yes, our good old sync handler. And you're like, why did you create that at the beginning? And so you can see some code here. And some of this is boilerplate. You can use this to get started. The Azure Mobile Services folks have this. But the, the gist of it is that when it detects a conflict, I, I forgot to put a breakpoint in here, and that's why this didn't pop up. It'll start cycling through this. And it'll, uh, it, it'll, it'll look and, and see that, hey, there's an error. I see a conflict. And then you can see here. You know, it'll loop through and see what they are. And you can see here I did an interactive one where I pop up dialogues and let you have the choice of choosing client or server wins. But in this kind of block of code, this is where you could put custom logic to, uh, to handle that. And so that is your sync. Uh, and it's, it's alpha code, and it's working, though. And so and it's working locally. And then you know, all you do is uncomment the code that I showed you at the beginning, and you can push it up to Azure. Uh, and you're good to go. So uh, that is it. Uh, sorry I went over a little bit here, but we had a lot to talk about. I'm really excited about it because I'm just an offline data sync guy, and so I'm glad to see that we got something new. And I really think it can meet a lot of your needs when you're building a line of business solutions. I know that we've had some other sync technologies in the past that do a million different things, but like lots of products, you probably don't use all those features. <laughs> You might find that the sync here is just enough for what you need. You know, I need to get data back and forth. I didn't want to have to write a million web services to do it. Uh, I need to be able to track changes. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> and, and I need to resolve conflicts. So all the basic key elements that you need, I think, are built into this. And so I think this is a great start to build those apps that just need to stay offline mostly all the time. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. And look at all this other stuff happening. And, uh, and please do an eval. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm gonna, I'll make sure I get the code up. I'll work with our folks to get all my code that I did up. Uh, and I'll also, also, worst case scenario, I'll have it all on my blog. Just robtiffany.com. I'll, I'll put the code there as well to make sure. Thanks a lot.